Welcome to the first Anglican Unscripted of 2020. I'm Kevin Carlson. I'm George Conger. I'm Gavin Ashenden on the 1st of January 2020. Okay, welcome back to the show. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, clergy and laity alike, this is episode 562 of Anglican Unscripted Recording. I'm here in a hotel somewhere in Middleton, Wisconsin, next to Madison. It looks like George is uh, back in the parish or at home. And Gavin, what country are you in this week? I'm in my little Tourelle in Normandy. Um, I'm, I'm so happy. To be here, I think better, I pray better, I eat better. <laughs> I oh, sleep the, better. the whole country's on strike. I don't know how you're eating or driving better, but. You yeah, know. because all the lo local farmers look after each other. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> so uh, we got you know, a lot of news and kind of perspectives to cover this week in the show. Uh, Gavin suggested we do a, a look back, uh, certainly 2019 and maybe uh, 10 years beyond, uh, at the start of Anglican Scripted to, to focus on. And I thought we'd talk a little bit about the news before we get there. But you have a responsibility as a viewer, especially a 2020 viewer in the uh, age of social networking, to help share this program. So if you get a chance, and I know you have a chance, right now you're looking at the show, there's a little thumbs up button either on YouTube or Facebook, just click it. If you don't like us, you are allowed to click thumbs down. We have no problem with that either. Please share us. Please subscribe to the program. And for crying out loud, if you're not participating in the comments, you don't know what's really going on. This show has exploded in the last six months in comments uh, on YouTube, and it's just amazing to watch all the people uh, from around the world who ha take time and either correct our opinions, <clears throat> not very well, uh, who sit down and add to what's happening uh, in the show, and those who uh, just say, hey, I'm watching from the middle of nowhere, love the show, you guys provide a great perspective, you're the only Anglican news source out there, and we appreciate that as well. So. Uh, on to, this is going to be more political than religious, but we had a uh, shooting in a Texas church in a town called White Settlement. Uh, I thought we'd just uh, tackle that because the first Episcopal blogger who, who uh, responded to this said it's a racist town just by its name. And I thought we'd just say that it was uh, named that town many eons ago because it was the only white settlement amongst the Native Americans in Texas. Uh, if you want to go to the Wikipedia page and find out why they're called white settlement. They actually had to vote 10 years ago, changing the name to West Settlement, but that got defeated by Mayor White of White Settlement. <laughs> George, uh, tell us a, a little bit about the news of a shooting in, in uh, <coughs> the church there. Church of Christ, West Freeway, West Freeway Church of Christ in the greater Fort Worth area. A uh, man dressed in a black trench coat and a black hood walked into a worship service and he pulled out a uh, shotgun, shotgun yeah. and he was confronted when he pulled out his weapon by a deacon of the church and one a member of the parish of the church security team. He fought, discharged his weapon twice and then rushed towards the pulpit. And the congregation, members of the congregation were screaming, falling to the ground. But then four or five other members of the uh, congregation stood up and one man from the back of the church, who was also on the security team, with his pistol, with one shot, dropped the man as he was running to the front of the church, most likely to continue the massacre. There were, and the one man died at the scene uh, the other parishioner died uh in hospital and the uh, gunman was killed instantly by the shot and the questions the the issues that arose are guns in church some episcopal dioceses have issued the diocese of atlanta for instance says no one may have a gun on church property um other uh, episcopal dioceses have uh, are mute on this point my Episcopal Parish has a safety team where 
at the main service, we have two or three people who have concealed carry permits uh, with their weapons uh, um, concealed on their person in case such an event such an event should happen. Mm-hmm. So the it the 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 incident in uh, Fort Worth or White Settlement uh, speaks to uh, well, it's the question of evil. Can we just by passing laws make sure people don't do bad things? Or do we need to do something we would prefer not to do in order to keep others safe? It's a, And the, the two sides are quite clear on this. The one side says, if by not having any guns in the hands of gun owners, uh, that would discourage unlawful people from using guns. Whereas the other point is that if so long as there are bad people with access to firearms, whether legal or illegal, you need to have a well-armed, well-regulated, a militia or people who can prevent, protect you from death and destruction. The FBI did a study, uh, I think it was seven years ago, where they found out that people are most likely to die in no gun zones. And the statistics were like 87% of shoot, mass shootings, so that's where more than three people are shot, occur in gun free zones where there's a big sign on the door and you're not allowed to bring your weapon in. Uh, and I think that's an astounding statistic at the failure to understand violence and understand that the bad guy doesn't care what the sign on the door says. Uh, all you're doing is making it illegal for uh, good guys with guns uh, to walk in there and have the right to protect themselves. Two or three years ago, I'm sorry, two or three years ago, the state of Texas passed a law explicitly permitting concealed carry weapons in church. Mm-hmm. Some church leaders, the Roman Catholic Bishop of Fort Worth being one, uh, said this is a terrible idea. And the Episcopal Diocese, uh, uh, their leaders did not speak officially, but uh, Jack Eicher was known to be in favor, while the uh, Episcopal Diocese of Fort Worth violently opposed this and said we should write our congressmen and senators and have this changed. Um, And at the time, uh, I think, was it uh, Joe Biden? Criticized sharply Governor Abbott of Texas, saying this uh, this is going to open uh, make churches uh, shooting galleries. It'll be okay corral because all these unhinged Christians are going to come with their pistols dangling from their hips to church. We and if they don't like the sermon, they'll let you know. And we are in year three of the University of Texas allowing concealed carry for the teachers and students. No OK Corral, no shootings, not one weapon has been displayed in anger at the University of Texas. If so, you would have heard it on the liberal press everywhere. Um, and that's a that's a very interesting. Sorry, Kevin, you finish? Yeah, go ahead, go for it. Yeah. Well, I wanted to go from this social analysis to, to, to the theological point, because mm-hmm. one of the things we've been doing on this show for a while is, uh, if you like, taking the temperature of different theological analyses of, of, of the human condition and what we have at one end is a, a kind of Pelagian belief in the goodness of human nature. What we have at the other end is uh, a, I was going to say more realistic, that gives my, my own view away, a, a more sober view of the sinfulness or the um, dysfunctionality of human nature. And, and along that scale lies the whole debate the church is having at the moment. The progressive, the progressive church with its new ethics and new ideas of sexuality is geared very much towards taking a a rosier view of human nature. We are grown up, evolving, perfectible, we can manage things, we can take responsibility. And the traditional view, I think, is that actually human beings are a a, a bit messy and you need to um, do your theology and your social policy with a level of mess involved. So what we have here, according listening to what you just described, is two versions of the gun law, one of which is based on uh, a rosy view of human nature where you don't allow guns on the grounds that people are going to be responsible and what you suggested is that's where you get the most murders as opposed to one where you do allow guns because you're going to need to defend yourselves because people are, are difficult and untrustworthy and they go mad and the best way of containing it is to take a lowish view of human nature and there you get the least damage. So I think what I wanted to do was say, see, we told you so. <laughs> well, I, I, think that, I think the point that can be made is that it's evident that Pelagius was a monk. He wasn't a parish priest. Because if he were a, <laughs> if he were a parish priest, he would have actually had um, 
in the life of the parish, uh, I'll give you an, a, an example. Part of the responsibility of a parish minister, a parish priest, is to know his congregation. That includes if you have somebody who you've never seen before, from time to time we get transients come in and I and the ushers sort of keep an eye on them, both hopeful and fearful. Why does this man need a backpack and why is he sitting in the back row wearing a trench coat in July? You watch it. Yeah. And then what about the 80-year-old retired deputy from upstate New York who wants to protect people and brings his uh, revolver to, par to church? Well, you kindly take him aside and said, you know, we really can't, I can't, I can't permit you to do this. And for because me, you're holding the gun like Barty Fife. <laughs> yes, you know, Deputy Fife, we don't need you because we already have a train. In other words, sure. it, the, it's, the, it's, a, it's the victory, the, the gun control advocates, in my opinion, believe in the victory of theory over reality. The reality is that evil exists, and we live in a world where we have to maneuver around evil so that the greatest good can be achieved for all people. Whereas, whether you take this in the way uh, the the laws are changing to allow strangers to basically determine the gender of your child if it comes home bringing a doll and it's five years old um to the reality of life uh it's just two two work uh there's a phrase that's current two movies running on the same screen mm -hmm. we're both seeing this that there's the same reality but there's such different worldviews that we interpret things so differently that we're not seeing the same show well I mean, we're two different countries. England does not have a gun problem. England, you know, has other problems besides this. I mean, there is a gun culture in America that doesn't exist in Europe. Uh, you are not... When I was little, uh, my first big Christmas gift was the uh, old twenty two uh, rifle Dad bought me so I could go squirrel hunting on the farm. Uh, that was a coming-of-age thing. And uh, when I was young, I fourteen or fifteen, I went deer hunting. Uh, every weekend in the in the fall, we were out shooting guns. When I was on Grandma's f uh, farm, I had the thirty eight special, and we were shooting beer cans off the uh, the fence for practice. That's just the culture I was brought up in. Nobody died. I never used a gun in anger. Um, it was just kind of our culture. You don't have that in England. Well, it's interesting you should mention culture. I think I'd like to move it, uh, the conversation along a bit sure. in terms of what you're allowed to say. I've just written an article for the one newspaper that allows me to write once a month for the Jersey Evening Post about the way in which the word phobia stops us telling us the truth. Sure. In other words, you attach phobia, as a phobic as a suffix to a word, and you can no longer tell the truth about it. The issue, the reason that matters in England is because the change of culture that we've had is that we have a knife culture now. That's right. And the level of killing that's taking place between teenagers using knives to kill each other has simply exploded. What what is interesting? You you talk about a sane gun culture, which is I think what you were describing in the states. Well, we have an insane knife culture, and on the whole, it's it's an immigrant uh, um, cultural aspect. In other words, uh, it has developed uh, in predominantly immigrant communities. That's not to say that. Uh, the, 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 the native English, if you're ever allowed to use that phrase without being locked up, uh, haven't adopted it or, or used it. But anyway, the, it's, the indigenous, the indigenous uh, people of uh, the First Nation people of England. The First Nation yes, people, the first I know. Nation. <laughs> first Nation English, that's great. We're in so much <laughs> trouble. <laughs> the Celts will then get very cross and say, no, we were First Nation people, you're Second Nation people. So we're talking about the Third Nation people after the Celts, followed by the Saxons. Uh, anyway, so but but it's it's a matter really of trying, trying trying to tell the truth. And one of one of the things that happened again in our country was that, to, to some extent, when the police were allowed to stop and search people at random, this kept the carrying of weapons to a, to a minimum. Why am I saying this? Not to make a political point, but to make a theological point again. The theological point was, the police were stopped doing that in case it was understood to be a racist act. I think it's a common sense act. But by introducing the egalitarian, utopian notion of racism, uh, you then stopped the police doing what they were good at, which was surprising people who were carrying weapons about them uh, with random searches. So one of the problems of not being able to tell the truth and to have an overinflated view of the goodness of human beings is that, that evil and disaster then increase. Have we talked this topic to death? 
We have. We have. Because <laughs> yeah, uh, England is gun phobic, and it's soon be to become knife phobic. No, no, no. I, I, my article said the moment someone says the word phobia, I'm phobic. No, no, no. I'm just stuck, struck by how prescient the movie The Life of Brian is. Uh, <laughs> because when did that that came out in uh, 78, 79? Late 70s, yeah. There's the uh, there's the scene where Eric Idle uh, says, "Call me Loretta," and we have John Cleese go down this. Well, you don't have a womb. How could you be a womb a woman if you don't have a womb? And then there's another one about uh, outlawing all sorts of weapons, and finally get down to pointed sticks. And there's a ban on pointed sticks after knives and clubs and everything. I mean, it's just it's just incredible how prescient these people these fellows were 30 years ago. They were indeed. Transition. 40 years ago. 40, okay. My goodness, 40 years what, ago. what other news we got to talk about, George? What do you, what do you got out there? Serious. Not not Indian corruption stories, but uh, I, I, we had a couple I, of Nigerian I'd like, stories. Oh, I'd you, like you, to what? slip in a bit of film and, and, and Pope slapping at some point. Oh, yeah. Well, let's cover that first. Uh, anybody paid any attention to video yesterday on YouTube, or they covered it on the nightly news as well. The Pope got frustrated with a uh, lady in the crowd who grabbed his sleeve, wouldn't let go, and ended up slapping her hand. Today he apologized for it, for being impatient. Uh, he said this during his homily on patience. So, uh, I have to I've, say, never seen, I, I've never seen a Pope do this. So, Well, I have to say, I only saw this in its, uh, where... Uh, uh, where Nancy Pelosi's face was superimposed over the woman in the crowd. Oh, really? <laughs> and, it, <laughs> and it was quite, it was a, it's a very popular uh, Twitter, uh, this little uh, Carpe Darkum, Carpe Duncum. It's a very uh, uh, popular uh, meme creator. Sure. Mm -hmm. And uh, he uh, took this little, and I haven't seen, I didn't say the original. But uh, it just was such so wonderful to see Francis has uh, scowled this woman and to have this woman's Nancy Pelosi's face is uh, it just was quite hysterical. Do look so, it up if you can on Twitter. Uh, well, I, I'm not sure, Kevin. Bishop, uh, previous Bishop Gavin, we all have moments when we just life gets to us and we react in the most human, benign, sometimes evil way. But that's but not what movie said. <laughs> no, but, but, but that's that. I was going to get to that point. So the real kinds of things one could say. Someone said, "I understand he's got sciatica." She really did give his arm a yank. Uh, yeah. And then you know, somebody else makes the point: was well, if you if you insist on being a populist pope walking amongst the crowds instead of of sitting in a pope mobile where they can't easily assassinate you, um, you know, you you have to put up with this kind of thing. But leaving all that aside, which is just the ordinary. I, I thought it was quite endearing how bad tempered he was. I thought, well, you know, that there we are. There's a there's a cross man who's been hurt by a, a gospel. But but the reason I wanted to bring it up was because there's been discussion about the film The Two Popes, and sure. um, uh, and Joe, one of the things this film has done is to big up Francis as a kind of wonderful late hippie hero in touch with spirituality and and ever, ever so kind and understandable, and portray Benedict as a shallow sub Christian. Uh, person of no great regard, whereas um, reading reading Benedict, I read him as an Anglican, of course, I, I read him and loved him as an Anglican. I thought he was a very profound, prayerful theologian of the, of the rare kind. You don't get many people who are that theologically educated who've kept up a sense of awe and worship and have clearly got to know the living God. And his, his two books on Jesus, uh, both set in one at Christmas and one at Easter, are really very good indeed. There are three. So, Three. Three. Yeah. Three volumes. Only, three. Only, well, that explains why I'm only half-baked. I've only read two of them. <laughs> so <laughs> so the, the reason this matters is because in the film, if you, if you know and love Benedict and you appreciate his writing, it's very hard to have Hollywood present him as this, this cardboard cut-out idiot with the with the hippie getting all the best lines so so la last night the hippie turned out not to be quite such a peace loving hippie which is fine he's allowed to be but but i thought well you know that would that would never have made it into the film <laughs> that's hollywood i mean the reality is it's probably a wonderful film but it's fiction 
you know, and uh, that's just the way you want to get people to watch your uh, program is you write it wonderfully. You have great writers, great directors. I went to a movie uh, in the theaters called Knives Out, which is directed in, in a 70s style uh, murder mystery. It's a marvelous, probably the best film I've seen in a decade where somebody really took the time to say, this isn't Marvel, this isn't the Justice League, this isn't a hero movie, this is just a well-written story we're going to put on film. And we're going to have nice camera angles, stylized, and that's what Hollywood does best. They make a great story. Here, they want to make a story about a real situation and imply that this is the truth. I was watching The Great Escape the other day as a piece of nostalgia escapism, sure. yeah. and particularly because I wanted to see Steve McQueen jump the motorbike jump over, over the wire. <laughs> the the Harley, like, yes. Hey. Or oh, the American <laughs> Eagle, yeah. Apparently they, they geared the, the motorbike up so that it, it could do that. Anyway, of course, the, the big row was the fact that the... Um, uh, knowing that the Americans were going to be, um, I've forgotten the historical political point exactly, um, but it was near the end of the war and the Americans were a separate category. So they moved the Americans out of the camp. So there were no Americans in the Great Escape. It was all done by, by, by non-American POWs. But when they came to make the film, it wouldn't make enough money unless they had the Americans leading the Great Escape. So we're back to the, you know, there again. They fought against um, the beauty of telling a story that will make money, but is untrue. Of course, if the Americans had been there, they would still have escaped just as beautifully, yeah, but they weren't. But <laughs> so, there, question is, do, how important is the truth in terms of history? Right. There's truth and there's Hollywood truth. Um, in Hollywood truth, they wanted to make Benedict somebody you would be Pope phobic over. And uh, I love it. Ooh, does that, see how I want there? <laughs> see that? Yeah. I saw that. Very good. <laughs> yeah, 2020 sorry, is the year of Kevin saying phobic too much. <laughs> Yeah, so that that's gonna be fun to watch. Uh, I intend to watch it when I get back to Connecticut. Uh, other news out there: we're doing this kind of slap shop today, guys, because not a lot of time for pre-show. Kevin's driving to Pittsburgh. So, uh, new, other news, George? Well, Kevin, I think you and I have been doing this for a, ten plus years. I've been riding for twenty-five odd years, mm -hmm. and Gavin asked us at the start you know, while we were chatting what have what is the thing that we've noticed the most what is what are we surprised with or about today that uh, we were just cocksure was going to happen 20 or 10 years ago and one of the things that gets me when we when kevin when you and i started this the the end of history francis fukuyama uh was the sort of the smart philosophy of the world mm -hmm. was that ideologies no longer mattered that it was sort of a mix between the inevitable forces of historical materialism. Uh, there was a sort of a neo-Marxist, neo-conservative worldview that all the great conflicts were over. We were going to some so how move into some sort of Whig interpretation of history of every year it's going to get better. Every year things are going to get better. The only fly in the ointment was Al Gore was telling us that the earth would be flooded by 2020 and all the polar bears would be dead. Well, the polar bears aren't dead, but what really surprises me as I look at the Anglican world over the past 20 years is that men matter. By that I mean mankind, people. Mm -hmm. it, certain people in certain positions. I did not appreciate that Rowan Williams was an outstanding Archbishop of Canterbury and, an, and, and a theologian. I did not agree with him, but at the character of the man compared to his successor, Justin Welby. I didn't understand how bad the only reason why the ACNA was created or is in its present form today is thanks to Catherine Jeffrey Shore. Uh, seriously, that's the only reason. Otherwise, we'd still have the AMIA as being the thing out there and conservative Episcopalians still in Pittsburgh and Fort Worth and whatnot. But we had a woman, uh, in this case, Catherine Jeffrey Shore, come in, take the reins of the Episcopal Church and drive it into the ground. We have Justin. Um, there's still a place for the great men in history theory, thesis that the right man or the right woman at the top can make decisions that will change everything. And this idea that we're getting to a better progressive future, all I have to do is talk about the gender issue. And I'm thinking these people are anti-scientific, not jobs, but 
in other words, the world is getting much worse. It's not getting better. Well, I think there's a lot of truth to that. And here's the word truth. The world, uh, the progressive world, doesn't believe in truth anymore. Mm-hmm. You know, there is no truth. And yet they freak out over fake news. Mm-hmm. You know, the, and I, I watch this all the time that how can you say that there's truth? How can you say that that's, you know, a, a fact and stuff like that? And then they'll see something in the New York Times and they'll just freak out. That's not real. See, here's the well, funny thing. We've got the greatest 10 years in human history in terms of economic development, uh, disease eradication, uh, the creation of wealth, the number of people raised out of poverty. But if you listen to the talking heads on television, we're in the depths of a depression that is just as severe as the 1930s. Or that, you know, we need to take... There's such a disconnect between reality and uh, informed opinion. Uh, but now, let's back up. That is the success of Anglican Unscripted. The nightly news has been wiped out. Nobody watches that anymore. Uh, all media is absorbed through the internet. Nobody sits down and watches uh, those three channels. What are they? CBS, NBC, ABC... Uh, what you, the Who stalwarts? You can name the anchors for those shows. I can't name the anchor I, for any of those. You know, the, the days I. of Walter Cronkite, Dan Rather, uh, Peter Jen- Jennings, uh, David Brinkley. Gone. Yeah, they're gone, and so nobody has a anchor of truth that they can sit down and say, "I trust this guy's opinion to give me the right news in a truthful manner." Uh, if somebody is finally going to tell me the truth about the Vietnam War and it's Walter Cronkite. I understand it, and I believe what he's saying. Nobody believes what they're hearing anymore. And the the success of Anglican Unscripted is the three of us can sit down and tell people about the news in an honest fashion. Yes, we're pundits. Yes, we analyze the news like anybody else. Um, but in the end of the day, nobody sits there and says we're wrong with any uh, degree of clarity. I think one of the things that's most affected me is the way in which the battle lines have changed and the difficulty is keeping up with it. I've just done a podcast for The Spectator uh, with that very interesting man, Damien Thompson, sure. uh, and it, it'll be coming out in the beginning of January. But he was very surprised when I talked uh, in the same way that George has just done about Rowan Williams, because the thing that impressed me about Rowan Williams was his capacity to act as an archbishop in order to try and keep the different values of the church together. He he identified with one more than the other. But he had the breadth of spirit and breadth of intelligence to realize that the genius of Anglicanism w- uh, was was made richer and deeper and more functional by, by, by keeping these strands uh, in, in some form of mutuality. And the thing that's annoyed me most about Welby is that I don't believe him. <laughs> So that although he, he, he uses a lot of evangelical and gospel language, which has the effect that he intends it to have, which is it lulls people to a sense of false security. And it reminds me of the third and fourth century Gnostics. They also used a great deal of Jesus and gospel language. And one of the reasons why apostolic succession became so important was that it was immensely difficult to tell how orthodox and how authentic somebody was just by the words they used. Jesus himself says something similar in the Gospels. And my, my hearing you contrast, uh, talk about um, Catherine Jeffers Shorey, on the one hand, provided you with just what you needed, some real clarity about what her agenda was. And for the poor old Anglicans in the Church of England, that's exactly the clarity that Welby has set about to mask. So that, for example, we have a project which is quite clearly driven by the PR people in, ch- in Church House, which says, look, here we have some new, very thrusting, marvelous women bishops, and we're going, we're, and we're, we're going to undertake unconscious bias training uh, in order to <laughs> diminish the number of men appointed. I'm, I'm amazed that any church could, with any degree of, of, of sobriety, talk about unconscious bias training, which is a Marxist trick. It, 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 there, is, there is no such thing as unconscious bias training. It's a means of continuing a degree of propaganda and demoralizing people who stand up against it. But this is the agenda of the Church of England in order to provide a platform for feminism and inevitably, like it or not, the relativistic views that those who are feminists carry with them. So this is what's, there's been a huge change since Welby came, one from which the Anglican Communion uh, 
moved with some difficulty uh, in a way that had some degree of mutual respect. Nobody got to win, but most people got to express their views to allow others to make up their minds. Two, what appears to me to be a well-oiled propaganda, progressive program, which is such a very long way away from authentic Christianity. And, I, and I'm, I'm fairly sure that as we look in the next decade, one of the things we'll see is the increasing success of that propaganda campaign, which will be matched by by diminishing numbers of people who actually subscribe to it. We will have a Church of England cake full of icing with lots of women leaders and very few Christians in, in communities on the ground living out the faith. How then could that be a successful propaganda campaign if people are walking away from it? Yeah, well, successful in, in capturing the heights or successful in well, capturing the imagination of the, of the masses? Yeah. It precisely depends upon what your aim is. If your aim is to mold Christianity so that it becomes a a, 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 a radical movement for the recalibration of power at the top of society, then it's successful. But if you if you believe in the kingdom of heaven, which is converted people living in sacramental communities, forgiving each forgiving each other's sins and sharing the gospel, then it's a failure. But the problem is the people driving the Church of England don't believe in the latter narrative. They believe in the formal one. So it's successful in their terms. Unsuccessful, I think, in the terms that Jesus gave us. Does it matter, though, if they think that? Because the kingdom of God is still going to be built no matter what they say or do. Gosh, well, that, that throws up so many philosophy. you doing philosophy. <laughs> this is theology, <laughs> not philosophy. Um, uh, <laughs> in, in terms of vocation, it both matters and doesn't matter. We all are called by God to serve him as we're called to serve him. So in one sense, it doesn't matter what anybody else is doing. We just have to be faithful. Does it matter in terms of making our work more effective? Yes. The, 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 more, the, church, the more the churches we have to do with our handicapped and perverted the harder it is to tell the truth about jesus without having a gloss put over it that that you know the gloss the, the contemporary gloss is uh, jesus really wants everyone to be equal and be happy in their sexuality uh, <laughs> that makes it much more difficult to say actually you've been saved from hell and you need to be born again and transformed into his image uh, it makes it makes the journey to the real narrative harder to to communicate so uh, Mrs. Anglican TV reminds me it's time to, to wrap up. So in the next couple of minutes, I want us to give our predictions for the next 10 years, uh, certainly within Anglicanism and, and the greater church. Here in America, it's been suggested again that we al allow uh, the IRS to uh, tax our churches and that there should be no tax-free donations. And uh, now, let's be honest, Anglican TV and the board of directors, we've always paid full taxes we don't go into a store and say hey we we are a 5013c we want tax free merchandise so i don't believe in tax free however i know what would happen if the irs were allowed to audit and allowed to say listen your theology does not meet the culture's theology you may want to adjust that to avoid further audits um that's always been a tool of the government and it's been a tool of presidents, it's been a tool of administrations, of Republicans and Democrats. George, are you afraid of that tool? No. Hmm? No, uh, yes, I'm afraid of that tool, but no, I don't think that tool will ever be welded. Okay. I, oh, okay. Hooray, this is, <laughs> have you finished, George? Was that it? <laughs> so, go on. The, the, uh, there's not the uh, first off there's not such a dying need for revenue that the government has to do it and conservatives and liberals are united behind the fact that unless we do this there's this untapped tap tap pot of money right Se second uh it would not uh pass uh it, it, it's it's frankly a silly idea that gets resurrected from time to time we did have something akin to this. In the 1950s, Senator Lyndon B. Johnson of Texas That's right. got the IRS to put through a regulation approved by the Congress to, pre to prevent churches from doing political uh, action. And up to that point in the history of the United States, churches could be as political as they wanted to. 
Well, the reality is that some churches are as political as they want to be and continue to do so. The Episcopal Church can lobby Congress. Black, black churches in the Northeast and the South can tell who they should vote for. But if a, uh, if a preacher in Houston wants to uh, attack the mayor, the mayor will send the police to listen to the recording. Well, at the end of the day, that, the, that, was, uh, that mayor was voted out and the, the law was smacked down. And the whole Lyndon Johnson approach to uh, governing free speech is has been challenged again and again in the courts and eventually will fall. So I just don't have, well, it, it could happen, but I don't think it's a permanent fixture of our future. Okay, so I think that Kevin is exactly right and George is probably wrong. Uh, I think it will be the, audit, they will be the decade of the audit, you're, you're right. I don't know if America, George, is right or wrong, whether it will be to do with money or not. But I do know that there will be the age of audit. And in Europe, in England, it will be to do with safeguarding and sexuality. In other words, uh, all organizations will be audited according to the extent to which they sign up to LGBT progressive issues. And if you sign up, then you can have insurance, rental agreements, uh, and all the paraphernalia that are required to play your part in society. And if you don't, you can't. And I think that will drive us towards the catacombs. So whether or not it's done in America on the same basis or on money, George, I, do, I bow to your, defer to your opinion. But, but certainly, see, Kevin, we have, the, we have the decade of audit coming. And in Europe, it will, it will significantly hinder the way in which authentic Christians who don't buy in to progressive agenda manage their affairs publicly. Uh, Gavin, if I'm, I may, uh, in 1619, the first English settlers came to Virginia to make money. In 1620, the first English settlers came to Massachusetts exactly for the reasons you described, because the government would not allow them to worship as they pleased, to organize as they pleased. And there is a strain in the United States, in its DNA, that the government is never going to I could just as easily see the establishment of a monarchy or a dictatorship. And I know some nut jobs think Donald Trump is going to stay in office after he steps down. See, it's the difference, though, between America and uh, the American worldview and uh, perhaps the European worldview. There is no, you could not get compliance. You could not get that. Uh, look at Look at the history of the ACNA. You have people walk out of buildings worth tens of millions of dollars in order to worship God according to their conscience. And people would do that again and again and again. And that's, George, that's great. I'm not, argue, I'm not arguing about the money, the money thing. I, I, as I say, I, I defer to your better knowledge of your culture. But I think Kevin is right. I, I'd be very surprised if you don't get people trying to audit you for, for you know, a political correctness. I mean, and it may be it's geographical. It may be there are only certain parties or certain, sorry, only parts of the states or certain states in the states where this happens. And you could be absolutely right that money's off limits there. But, but um, given the way in which freedom of speech has entirely disappeared from American universities quicker than English ones. Uh, but see, here's, here's the difference, Kevin, uh, Gavin. American universities are expensive kindergartens. They're child, they're child daycare for young adults. American universities since the 1960s have had no lasting intellectual, cultural, social influence upon society as a whole. Feel, you know, the universities don't drive society. They are the tail that is wagging that, that, of the dog. We have the most outraged, but there is no... Uh, I don't want to upset Mrs. Anglican TV, Kevin, Kevin, so you stop this the moment you feel you need to. But I, I, I She stopped staring at me so we can continue for a little while. In other words, in, in, in the hierarchical worldview, which, which I'm calling it hierarchical, uh, but in that hierarchical worldview where there's an elite church, there's elite academics, there are elite leaders and this and that, yes, they can control the show. The United States does not operate in that fashion. Uh, uh, I can believe that one of the problems we've got in England is that, that nobody under 40 votes conservative. So it was a, a astonishing dem demographically that Boris won, and it's presumed to be a one-off because of the way in which universities and schools have been 
pumping out the progressive agenda. So it's almost universally accepted in people under 40. There's a kind of brainwashing. Now, maybe this hasn't happened in the States, in which, I mean, presumably, George, that's what you're saying. What? The, the, the attempts to, to propagandize people for progressive culture. Let's, let's juxtapose. China is what the socialists and communists here in America want. It has a social credit system where you have to fall in line with the Chinese Communist uh, Party in order to have travel credit, in order to have bank accounts, and uh, not people monitoring your telephone 24 hours a day and not being uh, uh, pegged out on their camera systems. That is what the younger generation here in America have no problem with because it gives them their uh, political will. But we, in, as America, as frontiersmen, may never go all China. My problem is we may go European, which is halfway to China, which is uh, accepting uh, some very progressive notions of socialism, including transgenderism, including uh, the screwed up sexuality you have over there here in America as a norm. But see, the difference is, and it gets back to the first issue in our show, you cannot compel an American citizen the way you can a European citizen. Correct. Be the what, Why? I, I pack. <laughs> you, uh, we, have, we have Virginia, the state of Virginia has uh, changed demographics. She's staring again. We need to get going. It has, a, it has a high number of immigrants, and it has elected a Democratic legislature and a Democratic uh, governor and executive. And You've been listening to your episode. <laughs> no, and uh, well, Sorry, George, good point. Yeah, no, finish up your idea, me, George, and then we'll close out. Let me finish because it is important. Because yeah. I, I think people need to understand that there are differing worldviews within us, yeah. and I think the American maybe is because I believe in American exceptionalism and all this and that. But in the state of Virginia, we saw the majority of Virginia sheriffs, majority of the Virginia counties, say we will not enforce these laws passed by the state legislature because we believe them to be immoral and unconstitutional and we will see that and we will see that happen in throughout if you look at how the election maps look um you just see how the united states uh is is situated i i, and I, I agree with you up to a point but i see california and you see Cal you see that you see los angeles you see yeah. Los Angeles, mm -hmm. you see San Francisco. Mm -hmm. If you look at the election map outside of the main centers of population, if you look at the Imperial Valley, if you look at Northern California, you look at San Diego, you, you see the same uh, ideology, demography, as you see in Missouri, as in Alabama, as in South Carolina, as in upstate New York. It's not whole states. It's just pockets. And those pockets are collapsing. The public services are, are almost non-existent in Los Angeles anymore, and in San Francisco, and the United States. And we're reaching the point where the federal government is going to have to intervene, or we're going to have a complete breakdown. Uh, and do you think the rest of the country doesn't know that? Yeah, Mrs. Anglican TV has double-checked the drawers already in the hotel room. That means it's time to it's time to sign off. George, your point is well taken, and we're going to talk about it again in the next show. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. I'm Gavin Ashenden. You've been listening to the Rowan Williams tribute edition of Anglican Art Scripte, where all voices are heard with equal respect. There's like and you can make and you can make your own mind up. It's laser, been five, six, two. Yeah, laser eyes time. just staring. Oh, there she is. Are we done? Are we done? Are you done? Done? You're still you're on camera right now. No, I'm not. <laughs> We're done. <laughs>